Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Uh, many items coming up, uh, so make sure you hold on to your bulletins, but I'll go over uh, several of the items. Uh, after this morning's worship service, there will there will be a nominating committee meeting. Uh, Nina's Kitchen is open from 1 to 4 on Tuesday and Thursday. Wednesday, 6 p.m., Bible study and prayer meeting. Pastor has started a new study on the small books of the Bible, <clears throat> and that will be followed by a trustee meeting at 7. Uh, Sunday evening winter dinner and DV night will return on the fourth Sundays of January through March. And uh, this January will be the 23rd at 5 p.m. Uh, we'll have a light dinner, a fellowship followed by a DVD. And we do have a host for that dinner. Uh, family night sign up uh, the, for the game night. Uh, information sheets are in the literature tables. And I think that we might have uh, one date set on that. Uh, eat and greet will be Tuesday, January 25th at 10 a.m. Uh, note the day and time change. Um, this will be the winter schedule. Uh, bring your favorite breakfast food to share. Uh, if you need to submit a written report for the annual report, uh, those are due in to Pastor Charlie by January 30th. Uh, on January 30th, we'll have a missionary presentation from Nathan Robbins. Uh, he's looking to raise support to begin a church plant. Uh, in downtown Buffalo with Continental Baptist Missions. And the annual business meeting will be February 6th. Uh, lunch will follow the worship service and the annual meeting will follow lunch. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. As we look to the Lord this morning to pray, there's several things in your list to pray for. Uh, if you got the email uh, request that we send out, uh, add to this uh, Holly Grafton's parents who both have covid her mom being very ill in ICU, we believe. So remember them in prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to provide for all the needs we have this day. Father, we thank you for providing for us in time of need, whether the need is on earthly terms, seen as great or small. You are interested in every need that we have. And you're interested in the needs that your children as believers have on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. And so we turn to you and we trust you. And we look to you to provide for us. We thank you for your great love for us and caring for us. And we respond with love for you and giving the need of our lives into your hands. We pray today for these many needs that are listed before us. Uh, many folks with physical problems and difficulties. Uh, for those recovering from surgeries and uh, incidents and illnesses, we just pray for your healing touch to be upon their bodies, but also for your a touch to be upon their inner souls and spirits, encouraging them, strengthening them, being with families that are affected by their illness. And certainly we pray that you would provide for each one. That's a long list uh, of different people we know and care for, different uh, people who have different needs, but you know them all intimately. You care about them. And because we pray this morning, you minister to them. And we thank you for your ministry and your touch upon those who are dealing with some kind of physical affliction. We pray that you would also provide for all the other needs we might have this day, from that which would be a need of wisdom or guidance. Uh, perhaps it's a difficulty we're experiencing at work or employment. Perhaps it's a financial need that some might be having. Uh, certainly the needs are broad, but you are greater. And we put those needs into your hands, dear God, trusting that you will provide for us and minister to us. Pray for our country and the needs of this world we live in, which certainly is burdened under the, the weight of sin. And we pray for the spiritual needs of our country, that people even this day as they attend churches or see churches uh, online or television, they might be in their heart touched by the message of the gospel that you love uh, each and every one so much that you provided a way of forgiveness through Jesus Christ and that they might turn by faith to believe that that way of salvation and that way of forgiveness is for every individual, for whosoever shall call upon you, our Lord, can be forgiven and saved. And we thank you for those precious promises of Scripture. And we pray for the spiritual need of our land and those we love around us. Pray for the need of wisdom for those who lead us, the need of protection for our military men and women who serve our country. We pray for our missionaries, who many of them are outside of the boundaries of America, in foreign cultures and places, uh, sharing the word of God, that that might have a, uh, an effect upon the nations they serve. 
to share the goodness of Christ and that see people respond in belief and faith. And we also pray as we look ahead to these many activities of this new year that you would undertake for these things that are planned and for weather to cooperate and when it doesn't, for rescheduling if needed or necessary. Uh, we certainly know winter is sometimes a, a tremendous uh, opposition to a schedule that we might lay out. But you know that already and we trust that we'll be adjustable and that you will still bless as we work with things like weather and illnesses and all the things of winter. So we trust you for all these things. And we even now take a few moments to bring before you things that can't publicly add it to this list. Perhaps personal needs, perhaps needs for others that can't be shared, but things that burden our hearts. And so in this time, as the music plays, may we bring them before you as well in prayer. And may you answer them in the same way you answer the things we've prayed together for. For we bring them all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. This morning's scripture reading is from Colossians chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 1 through 8. Colossians 1, 1 through 8, if you'd like to follow along as I read. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love for which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before and the word of the truth of the gospel, which is coming to you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day we, ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God and truth. As he also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto you your love in the Spirit. May God bless the reading of his word. We'll dismiss for Children's Church at this time. They can head out to the activity center, I believe, this morning. And we are going to be in that passage in Colossians 1 that we just read. Uh, last week we had the bell choir here, and what a tremendous job the bell choir did. Uh, just amazing. Uh, you know, I'm not a musical person necessarily, especially with instruments. But, you know, that spoon thing, I might be able to do something with a spoon, but not a bell. <laughs> no, no bells. Uh, but anyway, uh, it was just tremendous. And it was a break between what we did at Christmas and as we start the new year, a look at the book of Colossians as we will work through this new year looking at this book of Scripture. Uh, it's a great book, Colossians, and we'll spend some time in it as we move through winter and then into spring, taking some time out, of course, for probably Easter and some of the other things that come along. Just before Christmas, I was wrapping gifts one evening. I, uh, they were gifts that my wife couldn't see at the time, so I grabbed our bedroom and uh, told her to stay out, and uh, she, she gladly would do that because she was going to get some gifts from this deal. But I turned on the TV because I just needed something mindlessly on TV to watch while I was wrapping gifts in December. And there wasn't any really quality sport event on, basketball, football, nothing seemed to be on right before Christmas. I will mention I waited till just a couple days before Christmas to wrap those gifts. And there was nothing on TV, so I was flipping through the channels to find something that uh, could be watched. I looked at all my favorite channels, the Smithsonian Channel, National Geographic's Channel, and it was stuff I'd seen or stuff I didn't care about. So as I was going through the channels, I came across a very interesting 
and it wasn't old, but it was, I didn't realize they'd redone it, an old game show. You ever watch Deal or No Deal? It was on in the early 2000s. I remember watching it back then. It was the, the, the show of the week or month back then for a while. It was hugely famous and then pretty quickly died right behind that. And, but I could see that as I got to this, I remember this, but this wasn't what I remembered because it was all updated. It was newer. And I so quickly you know, figured out they'd made a new version of it. And I'd watch the end of an episode as I tried to wrap these gifts and tried to get them wrapped in some decent order. And I'm not good at that, so it takes me forever. And then another episode came right on following the first one. And I kept wrapping, and as I wrapped, I uh, kept watching the show. Now, if you don't understand the game show, let me tell you what it's about. Uh, there's 26 briefcases, and in each briefcase, there's an amount of money ranging from one penny to one million dollars. You get to pick a briefcase, and it's yours. You'll take home whatever's in it. And they determine what's in your briefcase by opening all the other ones you didn't pick and ruling out what you might have. So as they go through all that, at certain points in time, they have an in-studio banker who will make you an offer based upon what's already been picked and what's not available anymore to buy your case and let you go home with a guaranteed amount of money. Thus, you get to say deal or no deal. Uh, have any of you seen this before? Oh, yeah, okay, so you're somewhat familiar. So this particular episode, as I got done wrapping gifts just, just before the end of it, everything's wrapped, everything's put together, uh, he's down to three briefcases, the one he had and two others yet to open that he didn't have. The values of the three were $750,000, $10, and $5. So he either had one of those three amounts. So he chose to reject the banker's offer and open another case. And, of course, everybody's on the edge of their studio chairs, and that case had $10 in it. So there's two briefcases left. He either has $5 or $750 thousand dollars. Now there, I don't think all of you understand there's a big difference in those two amounts. So the banker offered him to walk away with a guaranteed certain three hundred and thirty thousand dollars. Anybody here if I offered you that this morning to walk away from West Portland Baptist Church with three hundred and thirty thousand dollars is there anybody who would not take it? I don't see any hands. So I thought this was a no-brainer, you know. I'm Scottish. I wouldn't have got that far in the game to start with. But, you know, take $330,000. Take the money. And everybody in the audience is screaming, take the money. He has three family members there to cheer him on. They're screaming, including his wife, take the money. So what does he do? He astonishes everybody and says, no deal. He's taking home whatever he had, be it five or be at $750,000. So now everybody's screaming, hoping that in his case, of course, is $750,000. They open the case, and it shows $5. And there was a hush in the studio. These screaming people, every one of them, not planned, I don't believe, dead silence. And the looks on the faces, I think the wife just about passed out over on the side, the looks on the faces of him and his loved ones as they were grappling with the fact that they just traded $330,000 for five uh, was just beginning to come to understand that. So what in the world does that have to do with Colossians, you might be asking, other than it's a nice story? Well, it has a lot to do with Colossians. Colossians and the church at Colossae was at a crossroad of a decision. That man was at a crossroad of a decision. Take $330,000 that you know you have, walk out the door with a check in your hand, and you've got the money. Or take a risk, the risk being that you could end up with three quarters of a million dollars, or equal 50% chance you can walk out with $5. The crossroad of a decision to take the sure thing I know or to yearn for something so much more that I'd risk everything I have to get it. Now, this is in monetary terms for the guy on the show, but for the church at Colossae, it's in spiritual terms. Because they were at a crossroads, they wanted something more, it seemed, out of their spiritual lives, 
But there was going to be, and we'll find it as we move through the book, the offer made to get them something spiritually more, but it will turn out to be a doctrinal or theological error. So if they take it, they might end up with spiritually nothing. The crossroads was, do I take the truth that I know that the Apostle Paul had written about, that their teachers, Timothy included, had taught them, or do I jump for something beyond it, but if it turns out to be error, end up with nothing? And that was going to be their choice. So in a spiritual sense, their choice was very similar to the monetary choice of that contestant on deal or no deal. The book starts out with a reminder of what we have in Christ. The book kind of starts out, if it were the game show, it would be the reminder of what you could buy with $330,000. If you really had it, it was yours, what would it buy? It would probably buy you a new house or a new vehicle or put some money aside for college for your kids. Or it, There's all kinds of things, sure things, that the money you have that could, could be yours right there would buy. And so Paul says, let's first spiritually think about the things you have. And we'll start in verse 3. He gives thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. What we have spiritually starts somewhere. It doesn't start at birth. It starts at new birth. New birth is that moment that we exercise faith on our own to believe. There is no one who will go to heaven because their parent believed for them, or their pastor believed for them, or their best friend believed for them. Faith is of your own belief, your own faith. Salvation starts with faith. Now, Paul uses faith, hope, and love together as if they're a triad or a tri tri trio. But they're not really because faith really is the beginning. If you look at the scripture, where does salvation begin? It doesn't begin with hope. It doesn't begin with love. Although it began with God's love for us, but it doesn't begin with our love. Salvation starts when we come to believe by faith. Hebrews says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Ephesians says, for by grace ye are saved through faith. Neither those substitute nor can you substitute hope or love in there. And we're going to see hope and love in a minute as coming from faith. But it all starts with faith. It all starts with personal, individual belief and trust that Jesus Christ on the cross, gave himself to forgive us. And that he is the way, the truth, the life. And we come to the Father through him. And no other means, no other method, no other savior, no addition necessary to what he did. It wasn't like a deal in this sense that I'll do this for you, but you've got to do this for me in order to seal that salvation deal. He provided it all. He did it all. What do we have to do in response? Simply believe and trust in him. And so it starts with faith. If you believe, and there's been a lot of joking about this, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, as you might know, I have chickens in the barn back there. And uh, they came before every egg. And they did in the Bible, too, because guess what in the Bible? God created, if you believe in the seven days of creation in Genesis, he created the animals first, and as soon as he created a chicken, it wasn't long after that probably one of them laid an egg, but the chicken came first. So what comes first? Faith, love, hope? Well, we know what comes first, and it's faith. Hope and love are based upon coming out of faith. They are results of faith. Living faith brings them, but it starts with faith. So in verse 4, Paul says, I heard of your faith in Christ. That's where it starts. That's where it starts for you and me. We are born of the Spirit with the life that's given to us spiritually when we exercise faith. I did not do that until I was 17 years of age. I lived up until that moment without faith, without belief, and without trust in Christ. Thus, I remember the moment fairly clearly. Some folks don't remember it quite as clearly. They were a six-year-old in a VBS somewhere, and they kind of remember when they prayed and trusted Christ, but now what year it was, maybe a little hazy. 
I mean, let's be honest, last week's a little hazy to me sometimes. You know, it's a little hazier, but as a 17-year-old, I clearly remembered when I realized and humbled myself and said, Lord, I need Jesus, there's no other way. And you may have remembered that from your teen years or your youthful years or maybe even your adult years. It does not matter when you did it. It only matters that you did it. And as Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, he was spiritually born or would be spiritually born uh, when he came to Christ and believed. And certainly that's true. Faith comes first. But what comes from true faith? Here comes the list. Going back into verse 4, it says, Not only did I hear of your faith, but of the love which ye have to all the saints. Love comes from true faith. Living faith produces love. And that's not just here mentioned as love for God, the Savior, but love for others. Genuine faith produces love in our life. Now, our love is not perfect. It's not perfect like Jesus. That certainly would be the goal, but it doesn't happen immediately that I love everybody, you know, with the love of Jesus, and, and I'm willing to, to sacrifice for everybody equally because I just love everybody so much. We grow in our love, but it starts with our faith. And so Paul had heard that they had faith, and what did that faith do? It gave them a legitimate, genuine, real love, which they have for all the saints, for all the other believers. And it's very interesting to me that we have that love. It's the love of Jesus. Jesus had that love, and it showed to us in his life how. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's the fullest extent of love and sacrifices to give your life for whom you love. Jesus did that. And obviously that's our goal, that we love others with that love of Christ. And so it's interesting here, Jesus says the love is measured in this verse by love for other brethren. He didn't take it outside of the church family. Now we all know it's easier to love all of you than it is some other people who may not be here today. Isn't that true? There are probably some people who aren't here today who are very difficult to love. You may work beside one of them. Uh, we all will eventually if you haven't yet. And in those folks, they're difficult to love. They don't believe the gospel. They don't share our, our faith. They don't share our values. They don't share our behaviors. And they are extremely difficult sometimes to love. So Paul says, I know of your love for the saints, which comes from your faith. But it does extend out from just believers to others who are outside of the family of God. But I'm going to tell you, if you can't love other Christians, it's going to be hard to love other people who aren't Christians. That is for sure because some of them are very difficult to love. Love comes from faith. What else comes from faith? Well, the next verse it says, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Hope comes from faith. Now back just in December, I did a whole series on does Christmas really matter, and one of those weeks I says yes it did because of the hope that it brings to humanity. And so I spent that whole morning back in December talking about hope. I'm not going to retravel all that I said. I can say this now. It's great being online. If you want to look at that message, you can just go back in December. It's still online. You can look at it. I'm not going to retrace all those steps here this morning talking about hope. But I'm going to add to what I said back then to say that that hope that we have of eternity comes from our faith. It's because of our faith. We only have a hope laid up for us in heaven because we have faith and can believe what Jesus and God said. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. What does that mean if he goes to prepare a place for you? That means he has gone to heaven and is there now erecting your mailbox, so to speak. You know, this mailbox will belong to Frank, you know, a little snowmobile on that one, you know. And he's erecting that. He's preparing the place. He's preparing your place. He's preparing my place. And what does that give us That in those kind of words that he's preparing a place? It gives us a hope to know the surety that that's what he's doing. And if we believe what he says, that's what's going to await us when this life is over. You know, where does that hope come from? It comes from our faith, our belief, our trust. Has anybody here, maybe you might only want to wait, raise your hand, ever bought a house without looking at it? These days people do. They buy them online. They get to see pictures. 
Uh, nobody's bought a house without looking at it. Um, I do know some people who've taken that very large step and bought things without looking at them. Uh, they don't know exactly what they're getting into when they buy things without looking at them. I have a, I have a famous now relative by marriage who bought a corn farm to find out those were grape vineyards that he was looking at through the satellite view, not corn. Uh, didn't matter. He wasn't going to either be a grape farmer or a corn farmer. That wasn't the point. But honestly thought he was buying a bunch of corn fields and found they were a bunch of grape vineyards because it was bought without a personal look. It was bought online. So you believe by faith in what you might hear or see, and then you get there and you say, where's the corn fields? Oh, they're grape vineyards. They're not corn fields. One thing about that place Jesus goes to prepare for you or me, we don't get a preview down here, not even online. What do we believe? We believe in it by entirely faith. Entirely believing by faith in the hope that is laid up for you in heaven. Faith is where it starts. But isn't it wonderful to know the outgrowing of faith is what? A hope. A hope that when this body fails and this life is over, there's a place prepared for me. And it's prepared in some descriptions of Scripture that aren't by any means uh, total descriptions, but it's prepared in a way that's wonderful, called a mansion. It's called glorious. It's, it's called to be in a neighborhood that there's no bad neighbors. Do you ever think about that? In heaven, there's no bad neighbors. Only the redeemed of the Lord get there. There's nobody who's going to run their chainsaw at 2 in the morning or have a big loud party at 3 a.m. when you're trying to sleep. There's not going to be people who uh, do evil things to you that would, would tempt you to act back. It's not going to be there. It's a, it's a perfect neighborhood. And the streets, there's no bumps in those streets of gold either. You know, there's not a paving crew that has to come out to fix your street. It's a perfect place. All wonderful. That's our hope. And we have that hope because of what Jesus did. It's real. It's a living hope. And it's what we actually have. We have love. We have hope. And then thirdly in these verses, we have fruit. Let me read the next section. It says, which has come unto you as it is in all the world, verse 6, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you, since the day we heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. When you come to God by faith, in his grace of salvation, a free gift given to you from the truth of the gospel message and the word of God, and you believe it, you begin as you follow him to produce fruit. I believe as you tie this to verse 8, looking over Epaphras, who was one of the servants who ministered to them, who was a testimony to Paul of what was going on in the church at Colossae, it says in verse 8, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. I make this connection that this is really talking about, or at least looking at the idea of spirit fruit. Some of you know from Galatians what the fruit of the Spirit is as listed. Let me remind you, they start with love, which is already mentioned here, but from love we go to the fruit of the Spirit being joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, which could also be called self-control. And all of those, the fruit of the Spirit, come from faith. Can you get them without faith? Only very minimally and only very partially. Can a person who doesn't have faith in Christ truly be the embodiment of this description of fruit that we find in Galatians? And the answer is probably not. Maybe they can hone and work on one or two of them to make them you know, a predominant feature of their life, but it's all very difficult and very, very, very challenging without the Lord's help. Because for us, it's different. We don't produce them the Spirit produces them in us. We don't go and work hard and work so hard that we finally have a chair or even a spoon coming out of the end of the factory. That's not what we do. This is like the Spirit coming down and without any effort at all at the end of the factory line, a spoon and a chair appears. 
Gary says that would be so much easier, wouldn't it? You know, just look, a chair, it appeared. That's how it is with us. The spirit at working within us doesn't take all of our great effort. And finally, when all of our great efforts put together, develop one of these spiritual things like joy or long suffering. The spirit's working within us to produce those things through us. And the biggest problem the spirit has is us. Because we don't necessarily cooperate to do what the Spirit's trying to produce. You know, when the Spirit's trying to give us joy, the last thing we want to have in that particular day is any joy. We're happy to be unhappy. And have you ever had a day when you're happy to be unhappy? You know, you're just in a bad mood, and there's nothing that's going to stop me from being in this bad mood. Spirit or not, I'm in a bad mood. Uh, Maybe some of us as adults have gotten beyond that, but I've seen when we had little kids, that there were some days that they were just going to be in a bad mood. That was it. You know, there was no alternatives. That was the day. We're going to be in a bad mood. Some of us, we have physical afflictions, and it helps push us toward that bad mood. When we hate, ache, we hurt. Uh, we, we have to fight against that. Well, how do we fight against that? The first way we fight against it is to understand the Spirit of God living within us wants to produce something different than a bad mood. The Spirit wants to produce joy, peace, love, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. That's what the Spirit's trying to produce in us. And sometimes we're the biggest enemy to stop the production of the Spirit. It would be odd next spring to go out and plant a garden and then put, when all the plants start growing up and start coming green and you got these nice little plants, to, to broadcast Roundup over your whole garden. That would be kind of a failure to, to do anything productive. Every one of those little plants will die right to the top of the ground, will it not? Some of you who use that uh, as, as an aid to help with your vineyards understand that. You don't round up your tomatoes, do you? Or your squash plants. Some of us round up, poison what the Spirit wants to do because He won't force us to have this fruit. He will produce it in us if we're willing, but we're not willing. But it's what we have. You know, we have a sure thing. He's saying to the Colossians, here is the sure thing your faith will bring you. It will bring you love for others. It will bring you hope for your place in eternity. It will bring you the fruit of the Spirit. That's what you have. Now, I'm not saying that we should be stagnant in our spiritual lives and just be happy with what we've got. Because we always need to have more of what we have. There is none of us, none of us, me included, that's loving enough, that's hope-filled enough, or that's fruit-filled enough that we have arrived. And that I today am the embodiment of love or hope or spiritual fruit. None of us are even close to stepping forward and saying we're even close to that. We should desire more. But that's not the desire for more that's the problem in Colossae. And in this church, in this city, the problem is, how do you get it? You see, one of the problems is, many of these things that we want, love, hope, fruit, they don't come easy. As humans, we always want things, how? The easy way. And I'm not against that. If I'm doing a project, and I look at the project, and there's an easier way to do it than I'm doing it, I am almost all the time ready to try something different if it's going to be easier. However, in the spiritual level, Satan sometimes will try to lure us to take what he wants to present as an easier way, which really isn't a way at all. It's interesting, what is the way of, of the joy and the fruit, what is the way of the hope? What is the way of the love growing in us? Well, in James, here's the way. And it's not an easy way. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. And this is not a study in James, but it fits in perfectly here when it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You want more of these things, how do they come? They come through difficulty. 
You want to be better at loving people? How will you get better at loving people? By being subjected to people that are even harder to love than the ones you do love. Isn't that the truth? That's the only way it works. How will you have more hope? Well, when you're thrust into an even more hopeless position, that's how hope grows in Christ. When you come from hopelessness to understand the hope that you have in Christ. How will you have more fruit? When you're in the challenging spot to challenge you to not want that fruit, but to rest on the Lord and see what he does within you. How do you have more patience or endurance? It's being put in a place of needing it. That's an ugly message. I'm glad none of you walked out. But that's the truth. What happened in Colossians was some preacher came along and says, I have a shortcut. I have a way for you to take all the things you've got and you'll get all kinds of more of it. Tons more of love. Tons more of hope. Tons more of fruit. You just need to follow what I say. And that's the crossroads of what their decision's going to be, except that preacher who came to town to give them the offer of things that they really would like, who wouldn't like more love, hope, fruit? The problem is going to be a redefinition of who Jesus actually is. That was the price. Imagine yourself, deal or no deal, standing there. You've got a sure thing, a $330,000, almost all of us, are walking out the door with our sure thing. But there's this promise of more, this greed that appeals to the human flesh of more money versus lose it all to get there. And that guy made a choice. I'll risk losing it all to get more. Wrong choice for him. His case only had five bucks. There's nothing wrong with wanting more love and wanting more hope and wanting more fruit, but if you have to give up Jesus to get it, what could be the ramifications? You lose everything. All the things you want cannot be fulfilled by a Jesus who isn't the one that the Bible speaks of. And that's the crossroads at Colossae. You know, Satan can even take our desire for good things and use it against us. We understand that our desire for money might not be a good thing, correct? Your desire for three quarters of a million dollars may not be a good thing. It may be an enticement just of the flesh and not spiritual at all. But we also understand that Satan doesn't care. If he can entice us away from the truth, even using things that we would spiritually want to have, he doesn't care. That's why he is so sneaky. That's why his devices are called schemes. That's why we need to be on the alert for the enemy. But there are no shortcuts. The shortcuts don't exist. How do we, from our faith, increase our love, increase our hope, and increase our fruit? How do we do that? Well, how we do it is through some difficulty. It is the difficulties of life that expand us spiritually. And there's no shortcut to that. When you become a new believer, to get mature in Christ, it means you need to practice going through the hardship and seeing what God can do in your life in the hardship to mature you if you yield to him and you allow him to lead you. And that's how growth comes. It doesn't come from a magical message from a guy up front who says, deny Jesus, believe in my Jesus, and you'll get more. That isn't it. But that is what's going to be offered to them in Colossae. And what's worse is you say, well, I would never do that. I have seen even pastors... Ones I've known, ones I followed in my first church, who tossed half of what they knew from the scripture and taught to accept something else that wasn't true because they thought it would give them more. And it didn't give them more. It put them off on the wrong track. So we're all susceptible. We all need to be rooted in what the book of Colossians desires to root us in, the truth so that we will spot error. I end with this illustration because most of us giggle about it, but it's not really all that funny. Have you ever got the email from the poor guy or lady in uh, Africa, Asia, India, Europe, wherever they are, that they've just stumbled on millions of dollars and now they've got to get it to America and they've chosen you 
to get it to America. And because they've chosen you to get it to America, they'll share half of it with you. But first, you've got to send me all the money for postage or whatever it is. And we go, yeah, right. I'm not sending them a penny. They're not going to give me a penny. We see right through it. We say, that's just a scam. And yes, it is just a scam. By the way, uh, money laundering is a federal offense. If you take them up on the offer and they actually do that and give you half, you've, cr you've committed a federal offense and you could be subject to many years in federal prison. Just a side note to help you to see the way through that if you didn't realize that. But it is true, it is a federal offense to launder foreign money into America. But that being aside, we see it and we uh, do what? If it ever didn't land in our scam uh, email files or our, our, our junk file, we delete it immediately because we see through it. What the book of Colossians is, is the way to see through the scam and schemes of Satan to get us off the path. None of us want to hear that the path to where we want to go requires hardship at times. That's not what we want to hear, but that's what the scripture says. It's the hardship of life that produces through the Spirit more fruit, more hope, more love, and even strengthens and increases our faith. And that there is no shortcut. And Satan's the only one out there offering shortcuts. And they're not an offer of shortcuts. What it really is is you've got five bucks in your case if you follow him. And you're leaving behind everything else you already have. What do we have in Christ? First, what we have, the guarantee, what we have in our faith. It's love, hope, and fruit. That's what we have in Christ. This week you can be thrilled and happy and filled with the Spirit because you know that's what in Christ you have. And it may not grow a lot this week, but don't let anybody take it away. And don't trade it away for any price. Let's pray. Father, help us to see the challenges. Help us to understand what you want to do for us, but help us to understand that much of what you want to do for us is accomplished not in everything going well, but it's accomplished when there's challenges. Faith grows in a challenge. Love grows in a challenge. Hope gets uh, more abundant and deeper when we're challenged in a hopeless place. And the fruit of the Spirit grows when we're challenged. Patience comes when we're tested. And let no one, uh, by sneaky methods or well-placed words, contradict the truth of Scripture that we can get these things in any shortcutted manner. Open our eyes to appreciate what you've done for us, to desire more, but not to desire more and get it in a way that isn't true. For in reality, we sacrifice what we've got when we follow the wrong path. We pray for your leading in our life, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song as we close, He Leadeth Me. If you truly follow the leading of the Lord, and how do you find the leading of the Lord? It's through this book. If you follow the leading of the Lord... You will have that which you need for whatever comes this week. And he will take care of you. It may not be easy, but he will take care of you. Let's stand together as we close. He leadeth me.
Father, we thank you that you'll lead us, you'll direct us. The word of God will give us the, the correct way to, fo to be followed. And we thank you for our relationship with you, which started in faith, and that each and every week we can have the fruit and the, the life that comes from that faith, love for others, hope in our eternal dwelling place, and the fruit of the Spirit. And we thank you for what you do for us. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you.